Hi, this is Pam. Today, I'm going to give you an update of research that's just come out this month that is discussing the microbiome in multiple sclerosis. And this is a really important topic because this is truly the direction that we have to go when we want to find a cure for MS. And so what they're sharing in this research is really, really profound. And the two scientific reviews that we're going to be talking about, they were, one of them was published in The Lancet, which is a very well-respected journal, and the other one was published in Biomolecules. So again, this is the direction that we need to go. We don't want to get sidetracked with looking at a Epstein-Barr virus video, uh, as causing the, or being the trigger for MS. And I've shared that in a couple of videos just last week. I've shared why I feel that way. And I would really love for you to review those videos. It's very important because we, the people, we have to demand the ask, request, and just expect our researchers and our doctors to be going in the direction that is actually going to finally give us a cure for MS. That's what we want. So if we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha, and I am the author of Become a Wellness Champion, and the founder of the Live Disease Free. And if you like these types of educational videos, please share this video, like it, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And before we start with the findings, because they're really, really profound, but I want to talk about a couple of words just to make sure you understand what they mean. And this is really important. So there's just four terms that I'd like to share with you first. Number one, the term microbiota, because in when we're talking about the microbiome, the microbiota, a lot of people are wondering, what's the difference? And the difference is that our microbiota is really referring to all the microbes that live in our body. So I think microbiota is all the microbes that live in our body. And this can be a major factor in inflammation in our body and also autoimmune reactions. So it's not just MS, but all kinds of other chronic diseases also. And so when our microbes are out of balance. And over the past 10 years, there has been a much greater understanding about the role that the microbiota plays in regulating the gut-brain axis. And I've talked about the gut-brain axis and I'll, I'll redefine it again here, but I've talked about it in a previous video. So if you watch this video, and if it really makes a lot of sense to you, and it really gets you excited, I've got other videos on our Live Disease for YouTube channel. We have a playlist of MS and infections, and I share a lot of research from about the microbiota, because this is the direction that we have to go in order to recover. So the microbiota, so that's all the microbes that live in our body, they play a vital role in the, both the innate and the adaptive immune system. So they really are heavily involved. The microbes that live in our body really impact how our immune functions, our immune system functions. So that's really, really important, and that's the problem with MS. The microbiome, which is not microbiota but microbiome, that refers to all the microbes that live in our body, but also their genes, so the genetic material. So a lot of times when we're just talking about the microbes that live in our body, we should be saying microbiota. And then if it's microbiome, that is talking about the genetic material that they carry. <clears throat> and then a favorite word of mine is dysbiosis. And if you've been following my work, I've been talking about dysbiosis for many, many years. And dysbiosis means that we're out of balance. It's a state of being out of balance. We have far too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes. And so if you like science like me, or if you just skim some of the research, you'll see the word dysbiosis is used in a lot of different studies. So that's the third term. And the fourth term, just to remind you what the gut-brain access is, it's really a two-way communication network between the gut microbes, so the microbes that live in our intestines, and the communication is with the rest of the body. So this has to do with um, including the nervous, central nervous system. So not just our body, but all the way through into the central nervous system. So this is involved in regulating our nerves, our hormones, our immune system, and also our brain and our central nervous system. And when it's not working properly, when this gut brain access is not working, functioning properly, then we can suffer with 
inflammatory conditions, loss of inflammation, mental health issues. So this is different psychoses, depression, anxiety, et cetera, but also neurological diseases, including MS. So not just MS, but MS also. So the types of microbes that live in the GI tract, they vary depending where they're living in the GI tract. So in different areas in the GI tract, there's different diversities of different microbes that are living in those areas. And also the types of microbes that live in our body, they change as we age. And that, I think that a lot of it has to do with we're not educated on how to manage our microbes. We're not educated that this is an important thing that we should be considering. I really believe we can have a great influence on the microbes that live in our body if we only knew, right? That's the whole key. So the microbes that live in the human gut have a profound effect or influence on our health. And understanding how the microbes that live in our body, how they impact health and disease is really the most heavily researched topic in science today. And studies have identified specific microbes that cause, that are associated with a variety of different human diseases. So what do we see in the microbiota for MS? We see that it's very different than in healthy individuals. And I won't go into a lot of the details. I've shared a lot of videos on this. This is a lot of research is coming out every, like every month there's new studies coming out. And you can, the, one of the latest ones I did was talking about three neurotoxins that are produced by microbes that are in the intestines of MS patients. And they're really, really toxic. And they're, so they're not just causing leaky gut, but there's also leaky brain. Uh, so I shared that. And I've shared lots of other studies too, so you can take a look at those. But today, we still don't know what causes MS, and there is no cure. And they believe that things like stress and low vitamin D and obesity, smoking, and maybe the Epstein-Barr virus could be possible triggers, but they really don't know what is causing or what's triggering the MS. And there is a large and ever-growing body of research that really suggests that these disruptions that we see in the microbiota in MS patients is really the risk factor. And I believe this with all of my heart and soul because this is how I recovered from MS. It was by correcting the microbiome inside of me, the microbiota, the microbes that live in my body. And they really feel that the microbiota, the microbes that live in MS patients, that really impacts the immune function and the course of the disease. So studies have shown that, again, that the microbiota or the types of microbes that live in the bodies of MS patients is very different than what's found in healthy people. And also, it's, and I'm seeing this in a lot of studies where they're talking about people that have MS, they have dysbiosis, they're out of balance, they have too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes. And I've shared, just to give you one little example, Dr. Alan McDonald is a pathologist. He's an American pathologist. I believe he's American, but he's a very well-respected pathologist. And he found in the central nervous system of MS patients, 10, and out of 10 out of 10 people that he looked at of their, their central nervous system, so their brain and their spinal fluid, he found many, many nematodes, small filarial worms, in this, especially in the spinal fluid. And it, the relevance of that is for at least 100 years, veterinarians have known that when these worms are present in the central nervous system of domestic animals, so that would be dogs, cats, horses, cattle, sheep, some of the animals that we have in our life, but when these worms get in their central nervous system, they have all the symptoms of MS. They have paralysis, they have numbness, they have fatigue, they can go blind, they get spasticity, balance issues. It's just shocking the similarities between MS and when these filarial worms are in animals. And you wonder, if they've known this for over 100 years, why has nobody ever looked into this? There's probably not a lot of money in treating these worms, so they're not going to go in that direction, unfortunately. That's really sad, but that's the truth. So 
what I want to do is just take a couple of minutes to talk about some evidence that shows that this altered state of the microbiome in MS patients might be really, really significant. So in one study, so I'll, um, what I'm going to do is I will post the link to these studies in this video and we'll also be posting it on our website. That's probably easier. I'll put it all there. I'll put all the notes there. I'll put the videos there on our Live Disease Free uh, website. So we'll put a link. We'll post that in um, Facebook and in YouTube. And then you can actually look at these reviews yourself. So these are, the thing is that with the Epstein-Barr virus study that got a lot of attention just in the last couple of months, that was a very, very small study. That was one little study of 35 people that they looked at. Whereas these two reviews that I'm talking about, they're reviews. So like, it's good to get a bigger picture when you're looking at meta-analysis or reviews where they take a whole bunch of studies and they kind of look for common threads and commonalities. And are we seeing this consistently? So if you had a meta-analysis of many, many studies that showed Epstein-Barr was a trigger for MS, then you might start to wonder if it is. But when you have a little study of 35 people and you find that most of them had Epstein-Barr, but most of the general population gets Epstein-Barr, that's not a very strong argument. And so I'm not saying viruses could never be involved, but I'm saying that that was not a very large, significant amount of scientific evidence but there's lots and lots of studies looking at dysbiosis and, and seeing the differences and, and looking at the different types. So we're seeing that they're looking at bacteria a lot. They're not really looking at parasites yet, like worms, and they're not looking. They believe that worms are good, and so they don't even go there. They believe that, you know, because, <laughs> because we live in, in developed countries and we've kind of eradicated worms, then we're, we probably, that compromises our immune system. That could be why we have MS and we have other chronic diseases. This is the hygiene therapy or hygiene theory. Just because we are treating our water doesn't mean we don't have worms. Our pets have worms. The livestock that we use for food has worms. The worms are in our soil. They are in on the produce that we buy, vegetables and fruit from our countries, but also from other countries. Parasites are, worms are all around us. And just because we have treated our water doesn't mean that we don't have parasites in developed countries. We do have parasites. And if you actually start looking in the government websites like CDC, you'll see, and even in Canada, tapeworms, roundworms, we just don't talk about it. We say that we don't have parasites. And that's really frustrating. So they say that, or they're believing, and they don't want to research worms because they think that worms are good. They modulate the immune system. They suppress our immune system. They, like, that's what microbes do. They have all kinds of ways to make our immune system. They hide, they use mimicry, they use all kinds of ways. There's at least 17 different ways that microbes defend themselves in us. They don't want our immune system to attack them and kill them. So they call it immune modulation, where we feel that it's just a way that the worms find to kind of suppress our immune system a little bit so our immune system puts up with them. But they're not a benefit to us. Like with children, babies that are just born, they don't have worms in them. They're just fine. So that is really sad. And that's probably why they're not looking at worms at this time, because they really believe that they're good for us. And I tell you, I've passed lots of worms, and so have my students. And when you pass them, you feel so much better. And one of my mentors, Dr. Klinghardt, has said, the more you deworm, the longer you live. And I really believe that. So in this first study, they took, now this is really, really significant. So in this first study, they took fecal matter. So they took stool from MS patients and they administered them into the GI tract of mice. So these are experimental animals that they use in the lab. And so they took the, and these were, um, I believe that they were sterile mice. So these are mice that are germ-free, and they just took the stool from MS patients and they put it into mice. And when they did that, the mice spontaneously developed signs of MS. 
that quickly. It wasn't, didn't take years, but immediately th that happened. I mean, I don't know about immediately, but very quickly. So that is really profound. Then a second study, they transferred the same fecal microbiota, so the stool from MS patients, and also stool from healthy patients. So they had a control in this other study. So they had the stool from healthy patients, the stool from MS patients, and they administered them into, again, experimental uh, mice. And then they made those mice have the experimental form of MS. So they give the mice an antigen. It's a myelin ant antigen so that their immune cells go after it. And then they get symptoms of MS. So the model, the mouse model, the animal model of MS may not be accurate because they don't know what really causes MS, but they just know, well, if they give them this antigen, they, they have some MS symptoms, but it's not a true, like the animal model is not a true representation of what MS is because they don't know what MS is. So they took <clears throat> the fecal matter from MS patients and healthy, so they put, you know, two separate groups. One group of mice got the stool from MS patients. The second group got the stool from healthy people, individuals. And what they found is that the, the mice that got the stool from the MS patients, I'll just read it here. <clears throat> the researchers found that central nervous system inflammation was more serious in the mice transferred with MS fecal matter or the stool than when they compared it to the healthy individuals. So that's study number two. So this is a direct, like taking the microbes from the GI tract of a MS patient. I'm just gonna grab some water here. <clears throat> so they took the fecal matter from an MS patient, so the microbes, and they put them in mice. Both studies found more inflammation uh, so the results of the two studies showed that the microbiota of MS patients had disease-enhancing effects compared to that of healthy subjects or individuals. Now we'll look at the fecal microbiota transplantation, so FMT. So you might have heard of fecal transplants, and we'll just talk about that, and that's another huge amount of evidence. So this is a procedure where they take, let's say they have somebody who has like inflammatory bowel. So it's traditionally been used for somebody who has inflammatory bowel, especially C. difficile um, ongoing infections that they just cannot clear with antibiotics. And so they will find a healthy donor. So it could be a family member, somebody who is a really healthy person who they feel that their microbiota is quite healthy and they will take the stool and they will blend it and puree it and then probably strain it and then they will use an enema to give it to a donor. And this has been a life-saving treatment for people with C. difficile. My father-in-law died of C. difficile and they didn't offer this to him, but apparently it's really the only way and it has a very high survival rate. And it could also be helpful for other inflammatory bowel diseases, metabolic syndrome, um, obesity possibly, functional gastrointestinal disorders. But I have seen, and this is in one of Dr. Perlmutter's books, that it was given to MS patients. So in the first study, uh, and I don't know if these were in, the, in his book, but I do know that, that he talks about fecal transplants in his book. And actually one of our students is, was in his book and received the fecal transplant, and he did have significant improvements in his neurological symptoms, but it didn't last, right? We've got to treat those infections. Otherwise, you have to keep going back. And it's not in a procedure that a lot of people want to do. And how do you find a healthy donor? Because everyone probably has some amount of dysbiosis, especially if they've been on antibiotics, but it's saving people's lives. If they have no other option, it's definitely worth it. So in this first study, the FMT, so the fecal transplant, uh, was given for constipation and three wheelchair-bound MS patients had dramatic improvements after this fecal transplant. They had improvements in their neurological symptoms. They were actually able to walk. So they went out of their wheelchair and they were able to walk unassisted. 
That is really, really significant. That should like, That's why I'm saying this is the direction that we need to go to study to find a cure for MS. If you have that kind of a treatment and you come out of, so this is not even somebody with mild MS catching it early. These are people that were confined to wheelchairs and they came out of their wheelchair, three out of three of them. I don't know how long it lasted, but that happened and that's really, really huge. And then in a second study, a single, so one MS patient had the fecal transplant and she noticed, or he or she noticed that the, their gait had improved significantly and this person did not have relapses for uh, at least a year. They had a year follow-up exam and they had no relapses then. And they also had higher levels of brain-derived neurotropic factor, so BDNF, which is known to be low in MS. And it's something that's, you can get it up higher if you exercise, but it's something that's very, very healthy. So I'm, I'm going to stop here because there's so many, we could go, we could talk about different types of bacteria. We, I've shared that in different videos. And of course, they're missing the parasites yet, but at least we're getting into the right target zone, right? The, the, it is microbes for sure. And what I just, one of the studies, one of these two studies, I'll just end with this, is that they shared that with the disease-modifying drugs that we have for MS, it is currently not known what individual characteristics of patients determine the optimal treatment option. So they're basically saying that we've got these treatments for MS that are, they're all modulating the immune system. They're suppressing parts of our immune system. They're preventing our immune system from going into the central nervous system or even sometimes locking them in lymph, uh, the lymphocytes and the lymph nodes, et cetera, destroying B cells. So they're modifying our immune system. They're suppressing, it's not, a mo- it's, uh, it's really suppressing our immune system. It's suppressing our natural defense. And it's no wonder that they don't know which of the treatments really significantly helps specific types of MS, whether it's relapsing or remitting, whether it's secondary progressive, primary progressive. And so it's really sad that we're using these very, very expensive drugs. And a lot of people, they when they're getting their diagnosis, the doctor will give them a list of the drugs and say, here, you pick one. And the person will say, and so many people have told me this, and they'll say, they'll think to themselves, because they're probably too shy to say anything, but they'll think to themselves, how do I know which drug I should be taking? And how would they know? So it's really sad that this is where we're at. But the exciting thing is, is that if you guys feel that this is the direction, you do a little bit of research, and if you help us get the word out, and it's really creating awareness, the more patients that go to their neurologist and say, hey, there seems to be a lot of research talking about dysbiosis, do you know what that is? And the brain-gut axis, do you know what that is? And if they don't know, they're not keeping up with research. So very important to start talking in MS communities and talking about all of this, the microbiome, the microbiota, you know what the microbiota is now, is the microbes that live in MS. The microbiome is the microbes, but their genetic material. So it's more talking about the genetic material of all the microbes that live in us. Dysbiosis is really the state that we're in. This is why we're sick. And yes, there will probably be a few key microbes that are causing most of our neurological symptoms, But in order to recover, we have to restore balance, and that's the key. And then that gut-brain axis, and what was the other term? Let's just see what it was here. No, that was it. So I'll just go to see if you guys have any quick questions here. I hope that you found this really helpful, and I will. we will post the studies. There, if you don't have a science degree, or if you don't have a large background in biology, you can kind of scan things, uh, especially the abstract and the conclusion. Very often you find the, the really important things in the body when you're doing scientific research. But my job is to just simplify this for you, make it understandable, and help us to get on the right track. Help us to 
And it's really going to come from you because unfortunately there's no money in treating these parasites. And that's why we haven't really focused there. And again, what's, what I find really frustrating is they're talking about, well, you know, like if you give, if you give MS patients these disease modifying drugs, maybe that's going to modulate their microbiota. It's like, no, those disease modifying drugs are suppressing our immune system. Why don't we just figure out which of the microbes are causing our symptoms? Why don't we treat them? Why don't we support our body? Why don't you let us get back to having our health and our life back? That's what we want. And that's the direction that we have to go. No worries. If you missed the beginning of the video, it's recorded. So you'll be able to see it. Hi, I'll see if there's any quick questions here. Hi, Maurice. Nice to see you. Hi, Margaret. Yes, this discussion is very, very important. And I really hope you guys are the soldiers. You guys are the leaders, the trailblazers. You have to share this with other groups. We have to get talking about this. We have to start discussing this. We have to show these research studies to people and making it simple so people understand. And that's a big thing is that people just don't understand the science. So we need people to help spread the message. Otherwise, we will keep using disease-modifying drugs. We'll keep suppressing our immune system. We will keep living with this dysbiosis, these disease-causing microbes, and we won't, we'll be robbed of our life. Hi, Sheila from North Dakota. Hi, Valerie. Yes, it is very interesting, Margaret. And the sad thing is that this has been known for over 30 years, which is really sad. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi, Heidi. Why doesn't anyone else see this beyond me? Well, we've gone through this whole, the last two years, and it's been pretty bizarre. I'm not going to say what we've gone through. You know what we've gone through. And it really shows that a lot of us are just like, we're like sheep, and we just kind of follow. So if our experts are telling us a certain thing, and we're not scientists, we don't know. Like, I, what I see is that we're not even using common sense anymore. If we know that infections cause disease, and there is all this research for years and years that, and go to our website, livediseasefree.com, under evidence that MS is an infectious disease. Back in 1911, they were already finding bacteria in the in MS patients in the central nervous system and in MS patients in 1911 and then you look at fungus like when I was diagnosed in 1988 there were already books talking about candida and they were helping people to recover from MS and then looking at Dr. Alan McDonald's work with finding the nematodes the little worms in the spinal fluid also finding he found Borrelia, tons of Borrelia in those worms. So the, the worms are carrying Lyme disease into our central nervous system. We know, science knows that the central nervous system is not, an immune, is not a sterile environment. We know that the job of our immune system is to fight infections. So if our immune system is, is fighting why don't we look to see what infection it is? Why do we assume that our immune system has just gone haywire, right? And so this is the frustration. It's, we have been, <laughs> we've been just, whatever, led astray. We've been led astray and we're, we're not even thinking, we're not even using common sense. We're not using critical thinking. We're just trusting. And this blind trust has got us to this place. And the only way to get your health and your life back is to take responsibility for your health, to play an active role. So I'm 60 years old, and unfortunately, I'm turning 61 pretty soon, in a, a few months. But I'm from the generation where we just trusted our doctors, like we were healthy, and nothing was ever going to happen to us. And when you get sick, your doctor fixes you, right? You just go to your doctor, they fix you, and you carry on with your life. But when I was 28, I was diagnosed with MS, and they couldn't fix me. They told me that I would be completely disabled. There was nothing I could do. There was nothing I could do. And he spared me even trying. 
And if I would have kept that mindset, the limiting belief that I had about, well, doctors, that's their job. My health, their, my health is their job. If I would have kept that limiting belief, I don't know if I would have been alive today. I had a really severe case of optic neuritis. I was not able to care for my family. I was flatlined on the couch. My mom had to step in. It was hitting me hard, probably because I'm, you know, an overachiever. You just push, 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 and then you get stronger attacks, etc. And it's been over 30 years that I've been MS-free, but that's because early on I decided to take a different path. I decided to take risks. I didn't know how. I had no idea. I didn't have a health coach. I didn't know anything. I just got that one book from my mother-in-law, The Yeast Connection by Dr. William Crook over 30 years ago. And I'm like, there's hope. There's a little bit of hope here. And it took a lot of trying to research and figure things out. And it's really by the grace of God that I'm alive today. He gave me that first book, that first bit of wisdom. He's guided and directed me. He's helped us to develop this live disease-free program that has helped over a thousand people from over 15 countries all over the world in helping them to recover from MS and other chronic diseases. So what we do is we help you to, to take, to learn how to take charge of your health, to learn what you need to do. It's the cheapest way to recover. You can avoid a lot of expensive tests. You can avoid a lot of, you know, trial and error and using a lot of expensive supplements that don't treat the infections. And you'll know which way to eat to greatly reduce the food to the infections, to feed your body, to get ready to treat. But the way to treat is really to treat these infections. So I don't want to leave you hanging. I don't want you to think, well, okay, so what? The microbiome, so there's microbes out of balance. What can I do right now? I personally wouldn't do a fecal transplant. Um, if you're dying of C. difficile, I would, I would do a fecal transplant. I would for sure. But if you have any kind of chronic disease, what I would do is, is start to learn the steps. I've got lots of free content on YouTube, Live Disease Free. Learn the diet. Stop feeding the infection so much. You'll notice a decrease in inflammation and symptoms very quickly within one to two weeks. Support your body and just go through all the stuff I have. When you're ready to treat, you have to work with someone. They won't go away with diet. They won't go away with vitamins and minerals. You've got to treat them. But when you treat them, whether you work with a, uh, and this is the hard thing because not a lot of practitioners are skilled at recognizing parasites. That's something that we do. But we've got different ways we can support you. If you want a game plan that works, it's the Live Disease Free Program. You just watch my masterclass training, reach out to me, and you can actually start anytime soon. We just have this, we have people joining all the time. We had a um, lady today join. So the key is that the only way to recover, like you can't wait for the research, right? The research is going to go on for, I, 30 years ago, I was diagnosed with MS. And if I would have waited, it would have been good, would not have been good. So I took charge of my health. I, you can figure out which infections are, which treatments are most helpful for the infections you have. But you first have to get ready to treat. You have to support your body. You have to stop feeding the infections, then treat them. And you will stop the disease and you will have more recovery than you thought possible. It'll really shock you. And that's, just think about those three people that were in a wheelchair and that got different microbes put in their intestines and they came out of a wheelchair. So that is advanced MS. And if they can do that that quickly, that should tell you something, that there is hope for you. If you are in a wheelchair, there is hope for you. Oh, it's cutting in and out. I apologize. Um, I don't know why it is. We are having storms here. Maybe it's your internet or hopefully it's not mine. Hi, Christine. You totally believe it. You have parasites. You also believe that cancer, yes, cancer is an infectious disease. When we say parasites, we don't mean just worms. A parasite is a microbe that lives in you and causes you harm. It could be a worm, roundworms, flatworms, tapeworms. It could also be protists, which are single cell parasites like amoebas or giardia. There's all kinds. 
It could be bacteria, so Lyme disease, Borrelia. It could be E. coli. It could be different Clostridia species. There's a lot of nasty bacteria. It could also be fungi, so the molds like Aspergillus or Candida. So all of these. So that's the that's why that's dysbiosis. Dysbiosis means you've probably got worms, you've probably got protists, you've probably got fungi, and you probably have bacteria, bad pathogenic disease-causing bacteria. And so that's why we'll never find a single pill cure. You can't cure all these different types of microbes. You can't, all the way into the central nervous system, you can't get rid of them with a single pill. There are certain treatments that will be better for worms. There will be certain treatments that are better for for protists, bacteria, for fungi. Fungi are very different than the other animals. So that's why we have to consider dysbiosis. That is the key. And dysbiosis means you're really out of balance. You have too many disease-causing microbes and not enough health-promoting microbes. Yes, Deborah, it is crazy. It is really sad that the answer is right in front of us. Uh, did the patients have relapsing remitting or progressive primary MS? I don't know, and I'm not sure which ones. Oh, you meant in the fecal transplant. I don't know. But that is something that you can do a little bit of digging, and I can look back in um, Dr. Perlmutter's, I think it's called Brain Maker. He did talk about fecal transplants. I don't know if he talked about the three people. You can even do some searching, because I haven't talked about fecal transplants for quite a while, just because I don't recommend them. But as far as understanding where we're at, they're very, it's very helpful. Yeah, that is a great question, Mark. We can dig more into that. But I do know what I can share with you is that it doesn't matter if it's progressive or if it is relapsing remitting. Our students are both types. It could be primary, secondary, or relapsing remitting. It's all infection. It could be that, um, like, one thing to consider is that most people that have relapsing remitting, eventually it turns into progressive MS for at least 80%. So it could be that in the early stages of MS, our immune system is still strong enough that our immune system is able to get things under control after a flare where we have a break. And maybe with progressive MS, it is that there's things in our environment that maybe, and so it could be mold in our environment, it could be what we're eating, it could be stress levels, it could be not sleeping. There's all these things in our environment where our immune system could be so taxed that we don't get the breaks, we don't get the recovery periods in between. But over the years, as these infections become more populated in our body, we shift from relapsing remitting to progressive MS. At least 80% of people do. So that's really important to consider. Hi, Heidi. Hi, Melanie. So all the studies I've seen uh, require, so all the studies I've been in require one or the other. I wonder if it matters here. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by that. I, maybe you can elaborate. It, just type your questions in the question box. Put your comments in there. Let me know what you think of this. Please like and share this and subscribe to our YouTube so you know when I'm going live next. Yes, you definitely do. It, go through my videos. It'll really change your life. Like it, It'll really open your eyes to the direction that you need to go. How do you get rid of the worms, Deborah's asking? So getting rid of the worms. So our students, you'll see in some of the pictures I've shared, and I warn you before I share them, before you see them, but our students have passed over two foot long worms. Not everyone has those really big roundworms, but some do. Some people have tapeworms, some people have big roundworms. And how do you get rid of them? Number one, you have to change your diet so that the, the parasite, the worm medications work better and we support the body. And then we are energy tested to see which of the parasite drugs work the best for us. And some of them are really geared to treating roundworms and or tapeworms or flukes. So flukes are another nasty thing. That's what I had. Intestinal flukes can be three inches long. They cause a lot of pain in your stomach. They're linked with cancer. So a lot of these parasites, these even worms, 
there's one lady in Calgary that had a tumor in her liver and it was, I can't remember if it was like developing, but it was worms, like it, it might've been larva. So it's not just fungus that's involved with cancer, but it is also, they're starting to see more reports of protists and also worms. Uh, and, and even with tapeworms, they normally will live in the intestines, but some, depending on the species, some will move into the liver. And then the immature forms make their way into the central nervous system. And I've talked about this in previous videos where they form like a little bladder where there's a whole bunch of little developing tapeworms in the bladder. It's like a little sac, it's a cyst. And they can pick that up as a white spot on an MRI. And another thing that's just normally understood is that parasites in the central nervous system make lesions. So the lesions can be from parasites. It's known in science. So then why are we not looking at the lesions for people that have died and examining them like Dr. Alan McDonald did? Why are we not looking to see, could there be parasites in those lesions? What kind of, are there microbes? Are there, is there bacteria, is there fungi? And we're not, we're just considering the immune system. We're saying, oh, the immune system, it's the B cells, it's the T cells, we've got to destroy them, we've got to wipe them out. And it's so frustrating. So you get rid of the worms through, like the parasite drugs on their own are not super effective, but we're using oxidizing agents, parasite drugs, and we're using herbs all together, but also a very successful prep phase. So getting the carbs low and then, and just eating clean, supporting the body, then treating, using a layering of therapies. And I've seen lots of parasites come out of me too. And I've shared lots of videos on previous video on lots of pictures on previous videos. So hello from Grand Island, Louisiana. If you missed the beginning of the video, it will be recorded. I'll just be finishing up here pretty quick. Can hydrogen peroxide IVs help? So this is what I help my students do. Like you can spend a lot of money on your health. Some people that I work with, they've spent 100 to $300,000 on their health. They might've done CCSVI, they might've done stem cell treatments. Uh, there's so many things that you can do that are really, really expensive. Sometimes testing, working with integrated practitioners can cost upwards of six to $10,000, but they're not showing you which parasites you have. It's not worth the expense. So hydrogen peroxide IV therapy is, it's not harmful if it's a good practitioner, but if you have chronic disease, it's not going to be helpful enough. It'll be expensive and it is not going to be enough for you. The base camp of the problem is in your intestines. You have to really correct the microbiome in your intestines and treat systemically, but the intestines are the problem. So if you're using some hydrogen peroxide IV, maybe once or twice a week, the infections just keep depositing more microbes into your blood and it's gonna be kind of a waste of money in my opinion, in my humble opinion. So I personally wouldn't do that. We do use an oxidizing agent that's really cheap. It's something you can use at home. Um, I just can't talk about it or I'd be censored online, but it really helps you to pass the parasites. You can use it orally, you can use it enemas, and it works amazingly well. And it's cheap. It's like 50 bucks and lasts you for a couple of months. So that's what we do is we help people to keep the recovery costs down. We don't need a lot of supplements. We just need like a basic multivitamin mineral from plants, maybe a little bit of calcium, but all of these different supplements that support mitochondrial dysfunction or the genetic mutations or all of these different things that are buzzwords in, you know, mast cell activation disorder, all of these different things, it's all caused by the infection. So if we take too many supplements, we can also feed the infections. So we keep it really simple, low carb, really nutritious diet, taking a basic multi multivitamin mineral, supporting the body in various ways, and then treating as quickly as possible. We don't need a lot of tests, basic blood work to make sure our liver and kidney function is good. And just to support things like your thyroid or maybe your low on blood iron, et cetera. But all the other things don't really make a difference so that the, you can do ozone, you can do hydrogen peroxide, but it's going to be expensive. And if you're not treating the biggest base camp of the infection, which is in the intestines, 
is going to give you very limited benefit. Yes, logic is so easy. Common sense. Let's get back to common sense. So can you get pregnant with MS? Uh, yes, people do get, I was, when I was, let me see. Yes, I was, uh, I had two kids and then I recovered from MS and I had my third child, but you're probably wondering, should people get pregnant when they have MS? Well, we've had lots of people, like when you treat these infections, let's say if you are infertile, we've seen very often that women get their fertility back. So Lisa May is one example, one of our students, she's a nurse and she had a mass and she was infertile and she wanted to have a family, but she didn't know she'd be able to take care of them because of the MS. Well, she followed the live disease free program. You'll be able to see her video on our website. I'm going to actually this Friday, I'm going to do an updated video with her. This is at least five to seven years later, maybe six years later. She's doing well. She's got two little girls. And so we find that with our students that their fertility comes back, their sex drive comes back. And that's really helpful for couples for, you know, that it's just wonderful. So there are so many benefits to treating these infections, people's vision, their hair, their complexion, all kinds of things, their energy. You feel younger as you correct your microbiome. And this is a very important skill because this is what really helps you to live a very long, healthy and happy life. It's not just diet, it's not just exercise. How do you manage the microbes that live in your body? Okay, two more questions and then I gotta go here and let you guys go. Um, what, part, what part do antioxidants play in eliminating microbes? Zero. Antioxidants will support your immune system, but if you are infested with these infections, the vitamins and minerals will have very limited. I mean, it's good to take some extra vitamins and minerals from what's missing from your diet, but it's not going to, you're not going to recover from it. It's really not going to make that big of a difference. So Christine, my symptoms are becoming less and less, and I'm taking antiparasite herbs. They work. So yes, that, that is true. So what we have found is that there are herbs like black walnut and cloves and wormwood. And of course, if you're taking meds, you always have to check with your doctor. Those are the most common parasite drugs. And our students will pass worms with those, but they still have the neurological symptoms. So we have found that the herbs are great to use in conjunction with the parasite drugs, but the really large worms, and when we're dealing with infection in the central nervous system or in organs, it's just, and especially if people have had MS for a while and they're you know, dealing with a fair bit of disability, the herbs on their own, we're, we just couldn't get the same amount of recovery that we do while introducing also the oxidizing agent, but also the different types of parasite drugs. It's a game changer. Awesome, and Anna is one of the wellness champions. So she is... Um, doing really well. She's at the treatment phase and she's had a huge number of improvements. She's had MS hug go away. I'm trying to think off the, because we've got a bunch of different students, but the MS hug away, went away. Her stomach is happy. She's had a lot of improvement, other improvements with neurological symptoms. And she, so with our students, um, getting the blood work is done is really important because sometimes we've taken medications that could affect our liver or our kidney function. And we want to make sure that you're in a good zone for that. Or maybe you have parasites in your liver. So we know that the parasites do like to live in the liver. I, I watch videos regularly from different professors talking about parasites. And sometimes part of their life cycle is they move into areas like our lungs or our liver. So we want to make sure that we just, and we've had no issues with treating with parasite drugs, but it's always good to be wise. And that's why you need to work with someone. You can't do this on your own. All right. Thank you for all your comments. I will go through and will, my team will go through and will answer all your comments and your questions. Please help us get the word out. Please share, like, and subscribe to this video if you enjoy this kind of information that I'm sharing. And if you want to help us to get a, a different conversation going away from the Epstein bar and back on track to where we should be. And if you're at that place where you're like, Pam, I have watched your videos. I get it. I really want a game plan. I want to treat these infections then watch my masterclass training, which will be posted with this video. 
you can watch it. You'll understand more about the types of infections. You'll hear some amazing case studies of students that have recovered and their experience. And then we talk about all the steps that we take to recover. So thank you so much for spending this time with me. It means a lot to me. Take care and bye-bye for now.